Go oh. for it. All right. Welcome back, everybody, and hope you had a good lunch break um, to session three of day one, the next steps in identifying PKD therapies, brainstorming. Before we go to brainstorm, uh, just like to say that it's my pleasure to uh, co-chair this session. I'm Steve Seliger from the University of Maryland with uh, Dr. Nira Dahl from the Mayo Clinic. And our first speaker is Dr. Alan Yu. Dr. Yu is the Harry Statlin Professor of Medicine and the director of the Jared Grantham Kidney Institute and the director of the Division of Nephrology and Hypertension at the University of Kansas Medical Center. He has a background in renal physiology research and clinical research in PKD. He serves as the PI and investigator for CRISP, which is the longest running cohort study of PKD. And also with me, serves as co-chair of the clinical subcommittee of the PKD RRC. And the title of his talk today is Therapy for PKD, Quo Vadis. Go ahead, Dr. Yu. Thanks, Steve. Uh, can you hear me? Loud yeah. and clear. Terrific. So I want to thank the program committee for inviting me to talk. Uh, Terry Watnick charged me with exploring uh, what it would take to develop more effective therapies for PKD. And um, so, um, and to peer into the future and think a little bit about where we should focus our future efforts. Um, so my disclaimers are that this is a broad overview. Uh, many of the themes that I'll touch on are discussed in more detail uh, and have been discussed this morning and elsewhere in the symposium. Uh, there won't be time to, to talk about all of the latest research or even most of them, so I apologize if I omit your favorite paper. And um, excuse me. And um, hopefully I will provide some ideas and fodder for the brainstorming session that's coming. So we all know that there's only one currently approved therapy, Tovaptan, which acts on a downstream signaling pathway of PKD, cyclic AMP, and is arguably targeted to the collecting duct in the sense that it binds to a vas vasopressin B2 receptor that is almost uniquely expressed there but its drawbacks are on target side effects of polyuria. And although it slows down, it certainly does not stop or reverse disease. And so there is clearly an unmet need. There have been a number of drugs that have been uh, taken to clinical development and failed or been discontinued. This is a partial list and I certainly don't pretend to know all the reasons for failure, but some of the lessons that I took away from this are that there is an important need to have a deep understanding of the underlying biology and mechanisms by which these drugs work in PKD. Targeting signals downstream, particularly far downstream of PKD, may have limited efficacy. Drugs that are not specifically targeted to the kidney are likely to be limited by systemic side effects. We focused a lot on anti-proliferative drugs, but these may have too high a risk-benefit ratio for PKD. And finally, all of these drugs have been tested preclinically in rodent models, and we're now finding out that these do not predict efficacy in humans as reliably as we would like. So today I'm going to address these six points but um, in keeping with the theme uh, from this morning, I'm going to spend most of my time on point one, which is how do we address the root cause of PKD? And here I'm going to use AD PKD as an example, where the root cause right at the top here is predominantly mutations in the PKD1 or PKD2 genes. These in turn reduce the levels of functional polycystin protein in their relevant cell compartments, which may be cilia or mitochondria or whichever cell compartment we believe is important. And then downstream of that, we believe that this affects signaling, signaling pathways in the cell of which some of the more proximate ones are intracellular calcium, cyclic AMB, mTOR, and so on. But these signaling pathways occur in cascades, and so there are probably more distal downstream signals, such as 
activation of oncogenes like CMIC, cell cycle genes, mitochondrial function, and many, many more. And all of these work to alter cell functions like epithelial differentiation, proliferation, fluid secretion, and so on. And then I distinguish uh, what I call secondary processes, which are things that occur in, in a consequence to tissue injury. And I'd certainly put fibrosis in there and perhaps more controversially inflammation. And the point here is that signals, uh, therapies that interrupt this high up in this cascade are more likely to be highly efficacious and highly specific. Whereas the further down we try and intervene, the less the efficacy is likely to be, either because the contribution of any one pathway may be uh, small or because other parallel pathways may escape or compensate for it. Uh, and conversely, uh, intervening at these um, less specific pathways may be more likely to cause un unwanted side effects. So how could we address these root causes? And some of this has been discussed this morning. So hopefully I, I can organize our thoughts around uh, what could be done in PKD. And so right at the top would be, of course, correcting the PKD gene mutation. And there are now techniques to do this, such as CRISPR ed base editing and prime editing. The challenge is that to do this definitively, one would, of course, have to correct in the germline, which currently is not feasible. If we correct the mutation in kidney tissue, we don't know how, how many cells and how many tubules need to be corrected to really have a clinical benefit. But there are um, multiple folks now working on this, uh, including Dimitri Maxim, who uh, has formed a company with folks in Stanford and Xiaogang Li at the Mayo Clinic. Second would be to in some way increase the expression of functional polycystin proteins in the kidney. For example, by delivering the PKD1 or PKD2 gene. So this is classic gene therapy. As has been discussed already today, the PKD1 gene in particular is very large and currently not feasible to be delivered in this way. But other possibilities might be to deliver a functional smaller fragments of a gene, such as the C-terminal tail that Mike Kaplan has shown can rescue PKD disease in mice. And all of this um, is likely, we think, to help PKD based on a number of studies that have now been published showing that um, expression, overexpression or re-expression of PKD genes can rescue disease. So this started with the work of Dong et al. from Somlo's lab showing that expression of a back with PKD1 or PKD2 can not only arrest, but actually reverse PKD disease in mice. Uh, more recently, Marie Trudel's work showing that a transgene of a PKD1 cDNA can partially rescue disease. And here I just serve to highlight the work of Stephen Parnell at KU, who is, has been re-expressing the endogenous mouse PKD1 gene. And depending on when he re-expresses it, can either arrest or uh, partially slow down disease progression. And so another approach to this would be to attempt to increase expression of an endogenous functional polycystin allele using, um, using um, epigenetic approaches. So one approach would be to inhibit a microRNA that's regulating the PKD gene. This is the approach of the antagomir to mir uh, 17 that's been taken by Regulus based on work from Vishal Patel and is already in phase 1b trials. Another would be to attempt to activate the transcription of polycystin, for example, with CRISPR-based transactivators. And another would be to correct 
any inefficient splicing that's occurring. And for those who are not aware of this, I highlight here the work of Chris Ward, who has shown that in human, but not mouse, PKD1, there are two polypyrimidine tracks in introns 21 and 22 that impair efficient splicing. And here he shows that in seven human kidneys that the percent of full length mRNA that's transcribed is somewhere between 38 and 71%. And so humans are PKD1 dosage hypermorphs. And this is relevant because one could develop small molecules that could correct the splicing defect and improve the dosage to the point to just enough to alleviate disease, an approach that has already been shown to be effective, for example, in spinal muscular dystrophy. Sorry, spinal muscular atrophy, I should say. Uh, another obvious way to address this at the protein level would be to improve the folding and trafficking of mutants that are hypomorphic but potentially functional. Uh, and to do so, one could develop drugs that act as chaperones and bind to the polycystin proteins, um, as has been used very effectively in cystic fibrosis. Um, or alternatively, uh, to activate the chaperone machinery from the unfolded protein response of the cell itself, as is being attempted by Matthias Krapitz and um, Soren Fidelis at Yale. But this would only work, of course, in the small proportion of hypomorphic missense mutations. I believe it's about less than a quarter of PKD1 mutations. And then finally, it might be possible to directly enhance the protein function of the polycystins, assuming that we know what function is really directly relevant to polycystic kidney disease. And I would submit, and putting my neck out here now, that the field is converging now on two functions that we probably agree are important. And the first is that the polycystin complex, or at least PKD polycystin one, acts as a membrane receptor for extracellular signals, and specifically an adhesion class GPCR as has been shown by Robin Mazur and also by Mike Kaplan. And if so, it might be possible to activate this receptor with either endogenous extracellular ligands, for example, Wnt ligands, or with endogenous um, domains of the protein itself. And so here I highlight the very nice work of Robin Mazur published recently where she uh, determined the, the structure model the structure of polycystin 1 after cleavage of the N-terminal fragment and showed that there's an N-terminal stalk domain that remains that interacts with the top domain of polycystin 1. And in other adhesion class GPCRs, this acts as a tethered agonist, which here she shows by making a synthetic peptide, she made several of them, and showing that it rescues cystic disease in mouse embryonic kidney culture. And then finally, we believe that the polycystins as a complex or alone with polycystin 2 acts as an ion channel and specifically a cation channel. And so that raises the possibility that this channel function could be activated either with ligands, extracellular ligands like the one I mentioned, or other small molecules that bind uh, to, for example, allosteric regulatory sites like the one that uh, Kadaji Hai in the Delling lab has found to be bound by oxysterols in PKD2. In the last few minutes, I'm gonna just breeze through the other themes of the, um, that, that I think are important. Uh, a lot of what we talk about is cis progression, but the first step in this cystogenesis is clearly important and arguably if we could figure out a way to intervene there, it would have a much greater impact on the disease. But we don't really understand cystogenesis as well. Um, there may be reason to think that, that the mechanisms are different from cis progression and more focused on changes in cell shape, lumen diameter or planar cell polarity. 
as has been mentioned uh, in the session this morning, there's clearly a close interconnection between cilia and cystic disease, but exactly how that works is really unclear. We know that there are signals that promote cystogenesis and inhibit cystogenesis in the cilia, uh, but how these all cause a common effect of, of cyst, progress, cyst formation is still unclear. And I think unraveling this is going to be important to really understand the disease. Um, we talk a lot as if ADPKD and ARPKD are the same disease, and clearly they're not, and yet there are close commonalities. So we know that fibrocystin forms a multi-protein complex with the polycystins, that there are common cystogenic path pathways that are activated, and drugs that work in ADPKD also work in orthologous ARPKD animal models, such as tolvaptan and rapamycin. And yet ARPKD is phenotypically a quite different disease, indicating that there's still much to be learned about specific functions of fibrocystin that might be important to uh, figure out ways to treat that disorder. Um, none of this is important if we can't figure out a way to efficiently deliver um, the drug that we want to the kidney. I won't dwell on this because this has been discussed quite a lot this morning, but clearly this is uh, an area that many people are working on, but still the Achilles heel of uh, genes, particularly of gene therapy for this disease. And then finally, I think we need more predictive preclinical models. So we over on the right here have really great whole animal rodent models and also uh, models of the kidney and metanephric culture um, that are quite physiological, but they don't seem to predict human efficacy as well as we would like. Over on the left, we do have models that can use human primary cells for 2D or 3D cyst culture, but these don't emulate the physiologic cystic organization of the native kidney. And so we need something to bridge that gap which might be human organoids or human organs on a chip, if these can be uh, developed to uh, at scale and in a consistent manner for, uh, for example, for drug screening. But in addition to that, I think uh, whole animal models are uh, always going to be important. And maybe what we need is other model organisms. And here I'll just highlight one example, which I'll throw out here, which is maybe that the pig might be important. So as many of you know, there have been uh, multiple groups now that have developed pig PKD-1 models, including a group from China, Japan, the Mayo Clinic, uh, and we at KU have also collaborated with exemplar genetics to do so. And what makes the pig interesting is that it is a true autosomal dominant model so here you can see a heterozygous PKD1 uh, allele, and at six months, which is about a three-year-old child, perhaps, you can already see uh, a few cysts in the kidney, and here you see the increase in cystic index with time. And so for gene therapy, and particularly for those types of therapy where we are planning to either activate or or increased expression of the endogenous PKD gene, one needs to have a heterozygous model in which to test it. And so the pig might have a particularly important role in these types of therapies. So um, that's all I think I had to say. I hope this throws out some ideas that uh, folks can use to discuss in further detail in the brainstorming session. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, but my caveat is I'm not an expert on any of these particular topics, um, but thank you for your attention. Um, I, think, I think that there's probably just room for one question in the general session, and then we should move to the breakout sessions. And people should, uh, there were some great questions in the chat, but just let people can ask, mention those in the breakouts. Thanks.
Terry, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yu, for a um, really excellent presentation, very thought-provoking. Um, so uh, I'll go ahead and just uh, I'll just uh, pick the most recent one, which is, are the mechanisms leading to cystogenesis different for the different tubular segments as proximal versus distal versus collecting ducts? And would that somehow have implications for what, what kinds of mechanisms to target or targets for drug therapy? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, there are, I think, many other folks uh, online who are probably better equipped to answer this than I am. Uh, I, my understanding of this is that, uh, at least in animal models, uh, cysts form initially in proximal segments and later in large mature cysts are formed from probably mostly collecting ducts. Uh, we usually treat them synonymously a lot of our cell lines that we use for studying are proximal tubule cells. Uh, and so they certainly have some of the same prop cell defects from loss of PKD1, uh, but I don't think enough has been done to look at the differences and why uh, cysts eventually end up mostly being the collecting duct. Great, thank you. Perry, back to you. Yeah. Okay. So um, you should join your breakout room um, now. So you click on the link that says breakout room. You were assigned a breakout room. If you if you didn't register, then just pick one randomly, but hopefully everybody will distribute. In the breakout room, you will be unmuted so we can have like a good discussion and back and forth. Okay. So go ahead. So the breakout rooms should have all closed now, and we're going to give the moderators about 104 right now. Are, so we'll give the moderators another two or three minutes. And then each breakout room moderator will have somebody summarize sort of the main points that they came up with based on the questions. I'll go ahead and share the questions within that. But we'll give you guys a few minutes to if you get your thoughts organized. I think things were still going quite well and quite actively within the breakout rooms. Thank you all for moderating and participating in this. They can see you. Thank you. So Nicole's timer has hit zero. Um, so we're gonna give each breakout room about five minutes to summarize what the main topics they came up with were. Um, I believe Dr. Dahl was in charge of room one, is that correct? So if you wanna go ahead and go first, we'll just go room one, two, three, and then have the trainees wrap us up at the end. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so I think uh, uh, the first part of our discussion was um, in terms of thinking about treatment, when should that treatment happen? So the idea was that there's a difference between what happens in the epithelial compartment where the polycystins are very important to then what happens in secondary compartments after there's been perhaps more scarring, more cyst development and more changes within the kidney. Uh, so uh, there was really a push to say that we should be treating early. Um, the problem with treating early is we don't have great biomarkers for that early treatment time, although uh, total kidney volume exists as a biomarker. Um, uh, it, it may be not the, the most uh, sufficient one in terms of thinking about very long-term trial design. Maybe you have to treat for a long time before you see uh, an effect, and so how to make those, uh, um, how to take drugs that maybe are showing a, a benefit, but not having to treat uh, in, a, in a trial for a long time. Uh, there was a lot of uh, interest in figuring out how to increase the expression or the function of polycystins, um, particularly early in the time course and, and some discussion around treatment for that. Uh, and then also this idea that there has to be a multifactorial approach, that there are some lifestyle changes that are important, and this may have to go hand in hand with, uh, with what the treatment changes are. Uh, Terry, did you want to say more about the specific uh, uh, basic science interactions for what people then were talking about? No, the only thing I'd add is, I guess, a com the comment that uh, we, we really need to figure out uh, what the proximate cause is after polycystins are lost. Like, what is it that we're replacing? You know, we need to figure that out. 
you know, in terms of signaling pathways, et cetera. So that was it for me. Okay. I guess that was a very short summary. It did not take a full five minutes, but yeah. Did anyone have anything else from that room that they wanted to add to that summary? Or we can move on to the next remark. We are a couple minutes behind. So it's not, it will get us back on track. So Dr. Selinger, I believe you were in charge of breakout room two. Room two. No, Michelle was in charge. Dr. Michelle was in charge of breakout room two. Yeah, it was, was me afraid. and uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Parnell from the University of Kansas Medical Center led the discussion and the moderation. So he's going to summarize the room for us. Excellent, thank you. So some of the things we talked about were the usual suspects in terms of the significant hurdles, gene and protein size and complexity. And also the fact that there is not one single mutant allele as we might have in, in the CF where we have the Delta F508, it's a, a common target. So that was considered in light of the possibility of a molecular chaperone based therapy. We also discussed a problem of what is or are the right pathways to screen for downstream effects. And we still can't decide on the exact function to be restored for PC1 or, or the PC2 or complex. In other words, what is the right function that is actually antagonizing cystic disease or promoting uh, normal growth in the presence of the polycystins? Uh, in light of that, there was discussion about, is there a more genetically tractable system for analysis of mutants, be that a, a model organism? Uh, there was some discussion of yeast or cell-based assays, but again, you would need to know uh, what function it is that you're looking for. And also the problem of where in the cells is that critical function occurring, be it the cilia, be it the plasma membrane, be it the ER, be it the mitochondria, or be it the uh, nucleus. And a question arose about at what stage of that function of PC1 or PC2 would need to be restored. Uh, how early can it be done or should it be done? And uh, it sounds like group one discussed that as well. And also the question of how late can it be done? Uh, and at some point you're, you're simply gonna have too much fibrosis and other, other damage. So how can various hurdles be overcome? What tools are needed? Uh, there was discussion of need for a common set of tools that are available to all. Uh, you know, everyone has a different creed. Everyone has different timings of maybe tamoxifen or knockout treatment and uh, slightly different uh, animal models that they're using. So again, the topic possibly came up of genetic tractability of, of a better model system that could be used. Uh, which therapy avenues are closest to fruition? Most of our discussion centered around uh, drug development for activators of the complex uh, so that you could activate any uh, remnant PC1 or PC2 that is available and I make note that there will be a talk tomorrow from, I believe, a trainee in Marcus Delling's lab. Uh, so be sure to be sure to come for the sessions tomorrow. And a question was raised: What's the status, or has any work been done on anti-angiogenic approaches for cysts once they become detached from the renal superstructure? And our group either. Uh, didn't know the answer or conceded that perhaps nobody knows the answer to that. And finally, how can precision, precision medicine strategies be included in these approaches? Uh, I, I think we have to deal with the active question of, can we model our approach after the CF field, given the lack of a confidence, confidence in an assay system for function, and also the breadth of mutations that are present in the polycystin proteins? Thank you, Stephen. Was there anything else from that room that either Dr. Patel or any of the other participants wanted to add? No, this was this was the summary. Very well done, Stephen. Excellent. I would just add that I, I love the shell shirt there. That's <laughs> Dr. Selinger, you ready to summarize room three for us? And then the last one we'll do is the training session. Sure. Thank um, you so much. So we, um, I think, uh, good minds think alike because we we came up with many of the uh, same or similar 
hurdles uh, that were identified in terms of really understanding much better what the function of the polysystem complex is and what function is it, as someone said, that we're trying to restore in the first place. Um, some things that were perhaps not mentioned by the other two rooms uh, uh, already uh, have to do with, um, so understanding what are the, uh, I think, perhaps, epigen the epigenetic factors that might um, influence PKD1 expression, the promoter level or the splicing level, uh, even as we was mentioned, I think earlier, some things like diet or other forms of stress. Um, the uh, potential for um, understanding cystogenesis in other organs was also raised as I, I was an interesting uh, suggestion or concept that is um, pancreas, uh, liver, other organs that might actually be uh, easier to target or deliver a gene or protein product in vivo in human studies um, and, and to assay the, the effects on, on cystogenesis. Uh, not, uh, that was one, one uh, discussion point as well. Um, the real need for um, reliable biomarkers of uh, disease progression uh, beyond uh, kidney volume. So um, biomarkers that can be modified in the same direction and have um, and, and strongly predict response, a clinical response uh, for a number of, of interventions. And ideally biomarkers that would actually be agnostic to the specific molecular target of the intervention. So they're somewhere downstream, but are, are highly correlated or highly predictive of, of clinical response. Uh, we also discussed about um, who to choose for interventions. And by that, I think we meant uh, the timing of interventions in the disease span. So we, we agreed, or it was at least discussed that the likelihood of reversing uh, cyst cystogenesis or it seemed unlikely, um, but that halting it at a very early stage of disease progression could eff effectively have the same uh, impact as reversing it later, but that would require intervening earlier in life. And then uh, again, with you know, the challenges of involving even a pediatric population, but also ha not having reliable short-term biomarkers uh, that would allow us to determine if we're having a beneficial impact or like or to predict a beneficial clinical impact of the intervention um, without waiting you know, 10, 20 years to see what happens to uh, changes in kidney function, for example, or kidney volumes. Um, I think that uh, that encompasses really most of our comments that were not already mentioned and highlighted by the other groups. But if anyone thought I left something out, please chime in now. All righty. Thank you very much. The fourth breakout room, Victoria, are you going to be handling the summary for this one? All right, um, take it away. Thank you, everyone. Um, so our group addressed a lot of the same things that have already been discussed in the first three groups, but I'll try to summarize and add new additions. We also found that uh, the one of the biggest hurdles, of course, is like having a good functional readout for increased polycystin function. So like, because we had talked a lot about trying to figure out the best way to replace that function. And of course we need to know what it is in order to replace it. And once we figure that out, figuring out like the smallest possible unit of the polycystin protein to actually uh, um, achieve that functional replacement since there are so many domains in the polycystins, particularly polycystin one, trying to isolate exactly what is the functional part and how can we replace that? And how can we put it back into the cells most effectively? Because again, as we heard in the talks this morning, the trying to do any sort of gene therapy, the delivery to the kidney is a huge problem. And like, and, and a caveat to that is once we figure out how to efficiently do this in animals, it's a really difficult transition to take all of that animal research and apply it to humans, um, particularly because the animal environment is super highly controlled. Whereas in the human environment, it's very difficult to control patient behavior the same way we can a mouse or a rat. And so just that is one particular issue. And also it was brought up that there's one thing that is often overlooked when looking at animal models compared to human models is actually the, the evolutionary distance in these pathways 
like what has evolved differently in the rodents versus humans and actually like factoring that into all of our experimental approaches to make sure that we address it and can overcome it and that these therapies can be more efficient in humans. And we also talked a lot about the standardization of tools and what can be available in terms of particularly cell models, whether we want an immortalized cell line that actually develops uh, cysts and um, that that would be, I mean, ideally we'd wanna have like a primary cell based model, but primary cells have limited passage time and a dramatic increase in variability and so we also talked about um, in terms of applying precision medicine techniques, trying to figure out if there was a way, since there are lots of polycystin uh, mutations, trying to figure out how to multiplex them to make kind of like a broad spectrum approach to like using instead of like single mutation targeted, try to figure if we can target multiple mutations at once to try to aid more patients. And then we talked a lot about the biggest issue being the breakthrough cysts and how to target these cysts, almost like targeting a tumor to get rid of this and getting rid of the cyst as, that it's already formed, possibly taking the or targeting the metabolic differences in those cystic cells. And one example was brought up that there's differences in lipid metabolism in those breakthrough cysts and trying to target them specifically and maybe using a combination of gene therapy and possibly stem cell therapy so editing stem cells to correct the polycystin mutations, but the challenge in that is using those edit, reintroducing those edited populations and how will those overcome the highly proliferative cystic cells. And we also talked about additional problems in that being that the epigenetic changes, particularly stem cells can retain those, their epigenetic memory and that might be difficult to overcome in a therapeutic context. And I think that was everything we talked about. So, but... Um, anyone else in the room, feel free to, to jump in and say if I missed anything. Thanks. Thank you, Victoria. And thank you all for participating in the breakout rooms and the brainstorming sessions. We appreciate all the insight and all of the summaries will also be available on the meeting website once we get the recording set up and posted, similar to all the previous years on the PKDRRC website. Now we are going to have a feedback session from the clinical subcommittee for the PKDRRC that Dr. Selinger is going to present. And we welcome you all to participate and let us know how we can best help serve you as a community. Sorry, it's always good to unmute, figure out the Zoom thing eventually. Um, thank you, CJ. Uh, I'm speaking on uh, behalf of the clinical subcommittee of the uh, PKD um, RRC and the leaders of the clinical core from each of our sites, include myself and Alan Yu and Lisa Gay Woodford, uh, and a, a number of other investigators, uh, but also um, research uh, coordinators and, and uh, NADDK officers who have um, been participating with this committee uh, since its inception for several years. So it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about what we have been doing and resources available um, through this uh, committee recently. So I'm gonna start with, excuse me, there we go. I'm gonna start with our um, joint clinical and phenotypic database. Um, this is a project that we've been um, working on to really align all of the clinical and phenotypic data that has been collected longitudinally at each of the individual um, sites and each of the clinical cores. Um, this database is being hosted or housed by the Kansas University Medical Center REDCap programming team. So it is um, be behind their firewall. And it contains uh, at this point, just well, as of a couple months ago, 484 individual records of individual patients uh, with over 500 variables in a standardized data dictionary. And some of the categories of um, of uh, variables that we have are shown here. Of course, demographics, major ADPKD related complications, so things like aneurysms, uh, liver disease, stones, example, uh, measurements of kidney size and volume, depending on whether these are adult or, or uh, pediatric patients. Of course, uh, organ, kidney, and liver function, chemistries. We even have information on the pediatric patients on their birth history, for the adults on their reproductive history, family history, uh, blood pressure, anthropometry, 
and for some sites, uh, health-related quality of life. So this is really a highly multi-dimensional data set um, merged across three different sites with uh, data collected over uh, a number of years. This database is, not, uh, is uh, available or will be shortly available to all PKD RSC investigators once the REDCap database itself is fully um, uh, go live. In addition though, uh, the extracts of this data set are available to external users. That is, uh, investigators are not affiliated with the RC, but have an interest in, in projects working with this data. Uh, and they can do that via, uh, or request that via web-based portal. Uh, there is a standardized templated data use agreement already generated just to fill it that would need require just the specifics to be filled in and then executed between um, your institution uh, and, our, and the RC. And furthermore, under development, uh, under the leadership of, of Dr. Yu is a HIPAA compliant web-based data explorer. Uh, that will allow users to actually look at uh, subgroups of data, for example, by um, uh, Mayo risk class or genetic uh, profile, um, and, and to look at some of the characteristics and samples of uh, sample sizes of those. Um, within the last year, we have uh, developed and in, in, in collaboration with colleagues from the Yale Department of Genetics, including Dr. Somlo and Lech and Bessie, uh, a PKD genome browser that is live. Uh, at the website uh, shown there. You can also link to it through our PKDRC website as well. We have more than 400 exosomes of PKD patients that are already available and we're in the process of adding additional exosomes. And these include participants both from within our RRC and, and also from, from outside. Um, the user can search by the gene or by the variant. There is information on real frequency and annotation and links to ClinVar and other uh, public databases. And, and an example of a screenshot uh, of this uh, genome browser is shown here. This is for the PKD1 gene. Um, you can see uh, information on even on specific variants, their uh, protein consequences, and, and a number of different um, information from the annotation and allele frequency. Um, so this is this is a, a, a sort of living uh, resource for which uh, information is being added, um, and we encourage everyone to to check it out. Um, I mentioned about our clinical data, but the clinical data is uh, made even more useful by the fact that in, in many cases it is linked to stored human biospecimens and biomaterials. Um, this table gives an example of the kinds of specimens and biomaterials that are available. The specimens including uh, blood, serum plasma, DNA, uh, urine, and at least for Kansas, urinary exosomes. Um, and these are available um, either on all or a subset of participants, depending on the site and the um, study population that's been collected, pediatric versus adult. The biomaterials refers to um, uh, tissue blocks and cell cultures and cell fluid from largely from uh, nephrectomized uh, PKD kidneys. Um, and these are also available. We have uh, additionally developed a um, biospecimen collection and preanalytic processing protocol. Um, this is also posted publicly on our website both um, to uh, provide the information as to how these specimens are being collected under what conditions, but also potentially uh, to suggest some model uh, protocol for um, if, if other investigators or other sites are interested in uh, collecting their specimens on their patients for, for similar purposes. So these specimens are also available for uh, sharing, for request um, with, for investigators. Now the specimens, unlike the data, are still kept at each of our individual sites. Um, and so they do would require materials transfer agreement, again, beyond the data use agreement for the data, but we have a model NTA already developed within the consortium that can be used at least uh, to start the process. Um, so all of these specimens are linked, as I mentioned, to clinical and phenotypic data as described uh, on the first slide. So please, we encourage uh, folks to check us out and check out these resources on our website. And I will stop there. Be happy to answer questions. CJ, are you still there? Lisa has a question. Oh, sorry, Lisa, go ahead. <laughs> I did not see your hand. No, no problem. I just wanted to add that that um, we focused on ADPKD because we could harmonize that 
There, there aren't a lot of adult patients that we have captured with the ARPKD or the diseases that can phenocop the ARPKD. However, we do have um, a, um, a resource for children with, um, with ARPKD or its phenocopies. Um, and as soon as we finish harmonizing the, the ADPKD piece, we're going to turn our attention to having that resource be available to the community, and and that resource um, we're trying it, it's it's done as part of a national recruitment, as is the childhood ADPKD. But we will have samples, at least biologic samples, at least from a subset of patients. Um, and in the ARPKD, hepatorenal fibrocystic diseases. Um, we've made a big push to have these children um, uh, as much as possible be genetically resolved. So we'll know their mutations. Thank you, Lisa. And that gets to a question that was asked by um, uh, Chris Guerrero about genetic information. So the current REDCap database does not contain direct um, genotypic information currently, um, but um, uh, a, a certain proportion of our patients have been genotyped um, at each of the sites. And as Lisa was saying, uh, and in addition, um, the genome browser includes information on the whole exomes of those that have had that type of disease. I, I have a question. Absolutely. I mean, it's somewhat related to what you're showing here and also what we talked before. Uh, and I might have missed it, so forgive me if it was mentioned. Um, when we're looking for a material available to do research on, Ha, was it mentioned anywhere about organoids? Because it is now done for various yes. uh, diseases um, using either tissue or in, in PKD case, it will be basically stem cell based as far as I know. And I know people in Switzerland who deal with that and others. So are we looking into actually growing something with, with the disease and that provides A, material, but also a way to in real time to follow what happens as it goes and you maybe intervene. So that's my question. Um, excellent. And I think that I'm going to defer to the presenters who are going to be talking about that in the last session um, uh, about uh, the organized um, resources that are available. Um, at, uh, at I know at, at Maryland, we have used um, the human biospecimens for PKD patients. These are individuals who have developed end-stage kidney disease and hydrophrectomy. Um, to develop uh, cell cultures, so it's two-dimensional cell cultures, and those cells are available for sharing with those are epithelial cells. Dr. Dahl. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for that, that overview. The, the question is, uh, Steve, there are other databases being uh, developed. So the, the, AD, the PKD Foundation Registry, for example, is the idea eventually that uh, there will be a way to link these various databases together, the clinical ones in particular? Yeah, we have um, an excellent question, Dr. Dolan. So we have um, tr tried to develop this with the long-term goal in mind of allowing this to be merged and compared and compatible with existing data standards. And as you know, uh, those data standards, many of which were originally really developed for uh, clinical uh, trials or interventional trials, but those data standards are also undergoing modification and updating. Um, so we decided we would proceed ahead with this project, <clears throat> you know, without necessarily um, uh, requiring that our data be immediately compatible with the current standards, but with the goal of allowing them to be compatible with the modified and updated standards when those are available. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that answers your question. Uh, Can I make one quick? Yeah, this is with respect to the genome browser, which we want to expand. And so we're looking for contributions from the community of exomes. This is not patient level data. This is group data. Um, and so we want to make this as powerful a resource as possible. The only requirement is that they have cystic kidney disease. Um, and so we have a way uh, with, with the um, genetics people at Yale to house all of that data in an anonymized uh, way, and we can transfer it. So if you do have exomes that you want to contribute, please let us know. Just go through our website and we will uh, arrange it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Terry. And again, encourage everyone to check out that website, which is also in the, in the chat box as well. It'd be great to know the 
the clinical variables that you're collecting on your population so that we can harmonize it with what we're collecting in our population? And if we are able to get that? Yeah, excellent. And as soon as, uh, um, yes. So as we finalize the database and it's ready to go live, then yes, absolutely. We can, we can work on, uh, you know, um, sharing the code books. We have a standardized data dictionary and that, that is absolutely going to be, be shareable. Thanks. There is one more question in the chat, Stephen. Yes. Is there a plan to integrate the PKD genome browser with the UCSD genome browser? Ah, that would be layering other data tracks with the PKD data set. Um, I'm going to have to defer that question to, to Dr. Wanek if she's okay to try to answer that. Oh, so it, it's at UCSD? We didn't know there was one, but if you want to reach out and um, we're glad to collaborate. I didn't know there was one. So um, maybe we can speak after the meeting. He's referring to the broad full genome UCSD genome browser. I suspect, correct, Adam Bob? UCSC, not D. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, UCSC genome browser. Um, yeah, we're happy to collaborate. Just um, if you if you want to uh, reach out to me after the meeting, it's fine. Okay. Any other questions? If not, I think we're going to a break. So we could just um, add a couple of minutes to our break, and I'll work. we come back at two forty-five for the next session, which is tubuloids and organoids, which will get to the question that somebody asked. Okay, if there are no other questions, then let's break and we'll come back. Thank you, Thanks. everyone. Thank you to all the presenters. Thank you to Alan for a great summary. Thanks. <laughs>